Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa, hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. We are here today for four different cases. Two of them will be submitted without oral argument. The case of Estate of McVeigh versus Grinnell Regional, oh, yeah, Grinnell Regional Medical Center is hereby submitted without oral argument, as well as Iowa Supreme Court Attorney Disciplinary Board versus Rebecca Sharp. That is also hereby submitted without oral argument. Before we begin our first case, um, I want to welcome everyone today, and especially the students across the state who are watching us virtually. Today is Constitution Day, and we have the honor of being the first state in the nation to actually celebrate this special day. It started in 1911, and it recognizes the ratification of the United States Constitution 237 years ago on September 17th, 1787. But today, September 12th, is a super, super important date in our own state. Um, on this day, 157 years ago, Susan Clark, who was a 12-year-old African-American from Muscatine, was turned away from her school because of the color of her skin. This led to this Iowa Supreme Court's decision and holding in 1857 that racial segregation of public schools is unconstitutional. That made us the first state in the nation to reject the notion of separate but equal in public education. You can read more about this decision on Iowa, about Iowa's constitutional history on our website, which is iowacourts.gov. As you'll see in, in the oral argument today of what you're about to watch, the United States Constitution outlines the limits of what our government can do and declares the values of our country. It is the foundation of our judicial system, and we continue to use it in our work every day to fairly resolve Iowans' legal issues. So students, whoever out there from the state of Iowa, thank you for joining us today. And my colleagues know I'm gonna do this. This is an important school day. We're gonna acknowledge in order of seniority what school we graduated from high school. I am a Harlan, Iowa Cyclone graduate. Go Cyclones. Tom Waterman, I'm a, a Quad Cityan and I attended Bettendorf High School, graduated there in 1977. Go Bulldogs. Uh, Ed Mansfield, and I am an Iowan by choice, which means I graduated from Lexington Public High School in Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, this is where on April 19th, uh, 1775, the American Revolution bega began, and uh, not surprisingly, the teams were called the Minutemen. Good morning, I'm Christopher McDonald. I graduated from Des Moines Lincoln High School, home of the Rail Splitters. I'm Dana Oxley. I graduated from what was then Greenfield High School in 1986. It is now Nottoway Valley. Good morning. I'm Matt McDermott. I graduated from Kemper Catholic in Carroll in 1996. Go Knights. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm David May. I am also an Iowan by choice. I graduated from Kirksville High School in Kirksville, Missouri and uh, our mascot was the Tigers, although we have no Tigers in Kirksville. All right, thank you very much for allowing us to give a shout out for Constitution Day to the students of the state of Iowa. Our first case today is in Ray NS, and it appears as if the parties are ready to go. So Mr. Mayo, you may begin. Good morning, Your Honor, and may it please the court, counsel. My name is Eric Mayle, and I represent the appellant in this matter, N.S. This case concerns the impact of Iowa Amendment 1A to the Iowa Constitution to the statutory scheme set forth in Iowa Code Section 72431 for an applicant or a petitioner seeking to overcome disabilities imposed in this situation as a result of a mental health adjudication. By way of background here, uh, the appellant in this case was subject to two mental health adjudications in 2006. 
there was a third in 2008, which was dismissed, and the state concedes uh, doesn't impact his gun rights. The issues involved in the two that were filed in 2006, in which he did receive an adjudication for, uh, involved a substance abuse disorder and uh, oppositional defiant disorder and a concern about uh, bipolar disorder. At the time, the appellant was 16 years old. It, both cases were ultimately dismissed in 2007 following his successful completion of the outpatient services ordered in those respective cases. So since that time, 16 years passed. And in 2022, in August, uh, NS filed a uh, action under 724.31 to receive relief from the disabilities imposed. In November, shortly thereafter, uh, Iowa passed Amendment 1 to the Iowa Constitution. Uh, for clarity, the text of that reads, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The sovereign state of Iowa affirms and recognizes the right to be a fundamental right any and all restrictions of this right shall be subject to strict scrutiny. That matter later came on for hearing before the district court, and in that process, NS produced evidence satisfying each of the criteria required by section uh, 724.31. As part of that, he would have to show his mental health records, any criminal records, if there were any, he would have to provide proof via testimony and character statements of his reputation and any changes in his circumstances since the entry of the orders. Submit for an evaluation shortly before the hearing. Was he forthwith with all, regarding all of the things that had transpired up to that point? State argues that he initially wasn't and that and I would point to the later uh, appearance. He made a multiple, uh, multiple appearances as part of that evaluation. And I think the later appearance, he did clarify some of his concerns as to why he wasn't entirely forthcoming at the first visit, and then provided all of the information at the second visit. Not quite all. Didn't she do a prescription record database check, and, which turned out he had not told her about some fairly recent prescriptions for uh, for medication, including uh, benzodiazepine. Is that right? I the record does indicate that he has a prescription for benzodiazepine. I'm not entirely clear on what the discussion was other than what the provider relays about that conversation. So whether or not he disclosed that or it was eventually, or it was known that that would be something that would come up by way of that check, I, I can't say. Or notes that he, he had um, addiction issues back in 2010 um, with Xanax and had to be weaned off it and, and with treatment including Valium or benzodiazepine and hasn't, and then he asserts he hadn't taken anything like that since. So it, was he lying to her, to the therapist or to, to the psychiatric nurse? My interpretation, I think that when you're dealing with a mental health professional versus someone who's not a mental health professional, when he would say he hadn't had anything like that, perhaps he meant nothing like Xanax, and not understanding the, uh, the similarities that that line of drugs may have. Um, of course, I'm reading it through um, lenses as he's my client, but, but certainly I don't think that that, um, that part of the record demonstrates an intent to mislead or leave out uh, history that he's gone through uh, from that standpoint. I think he was uh, mostly um, forthwith in terms of talking about the struggles that he had with Xanax. That um, the district court made findings related to his credibility, how much deference do we give that? My understanding is that de novo review applies in this case. Um, with regard to credibility findings, I believe this court can give the district court some weight because all this court has in front of it, of course, is the, the transcript and the entire record. Uh, the district court, of course, is in a better position to uh, assess the credibility of witnesses. Um, so there should be some weight, uh, there can be some weight given to the district court. However, I believe that the district court's findings are not supported uh, by the evidence in the plain record uh, before this court. And so I believe in this court's de novo review, 
um, that this court should arrive at different conclusions. Support it. I think that a lot of your argument is based on because it wasn't there. I mean, there's the incident with the uh, benzos that was allegedly not disclosed, and I think the record is pretty clear it wasn't. What Something else that was missing that would have maybe helped the court, and, and so it's an incomplete record, is any kind of... Uh, summary of how the people were, what, what the people were um, thinking who committed him years earlier, his mom, his dad, his aunt, noticeably absent were any comments, letters of support or against. So I think it's easy to go out and find letters that are, so you could get 10 letters and if three are negative, you only turn seven in. So why, why do you say that the evidence does not support it when there's significant evidence not there? I think that one of the, the points the state does stress in its uh, argument in this matter is that um, the individuals um, that were in support of uh, NS were individuals who hadn't known him that long. Well, the reality is in these uh, folks who did submit character statements, that they've known him for years. Going back four years, we're talking about not just family members, but employers. Um, so it's not just those closest to him, but specifically with regard to the family members that uh, resulted in him receiving the adjudications to begin with. I think the 2008 matter is instructive to that point because in 2008, even though that has no bearing on his rights now, there was a separate uh, application for adjudication filed uh, against him, and it was, I believe, supported by his father and maternal uh, grandmother. And in that, the essentially was denied because uh, th the provider didn't believe there was a mental health issue, believed there was a behavioral issue, and specifically pointed at issues with the parents. And that's something that uh, NS then in his testimony in this matter essentially reiterates to say. Right? There are lots of problems between teenagers and parents. I think we've all been there. But I also know from my experience of dealing with hundreds, probably thousands of commitments, that when a parent signs that paper, it kills them. It ain't easy to sign. Um, and so to know that parents actually took that step not once but twice, as well as family members, isn't that a significant factor? Could be. Um, but I also think that needs to be balanced against the, the quality of the uh, character statements that we did receive in this case and the lived history of NS since that time. So whether he has a close relationship with his parents, as it would seem that he clearly does not at this point, he does have a close relationship with his wife and his two children that he continues to raise, that he has a, a long employment relationship. He's worked for over six years as a commercial truck driver. As part of that, has to maintain a Class A driving uh, license. He then has to submit to drug tests periodically, random drug tests. And uh, he has had to demonstrate his sobriety, his reliability over that time. There's no criminal record that's of concern in this case. So over the 16 and what became 17, now 17 plus years since the uh, adjudication and the underlying 2006 matters, he's demonstrated that he doesn't have those concerns and he has the ability to uh, build relationships with folks who can then speak to his uh, reliability and the lack of concern for him having these rights restored. Go ahead. You. Uh, I'd like to turn to uh, the challenge to uh, section 724.31. Uh, whom does that statute place the burden for proving relief? So that statute doesn't specifically state that. It, I would say, and in my argument here, is that it clearly places a burden of production on the petitioner because it lays out the various types of evidence that must be submitted. Failing that, the application would be denied. And it sets forth the, the standard that needs to be applied, which is a preponderance standard. Uh, specifically, we're not taking any issue with that. The issue is placing this preponderance, preponderance standard, this burden of proof, on the petitioner in this case. Uh, this court has already commented and noted in uh, Rivera versus Woodward Resource Center in 2015 that it's unusual to place a, it's rare to place a, a burden on a plaintiff to prove a negative. Well, essentially, that's what's going on here, where the district court is saying uh, NS failed to show that he wouldn't be a threat or that he. But is it is it a little different here in that the state bore the burden initially in 20? 
06 to prove that he wasn't mentally fit to, to have a firearm? I think that that's certainly a reasonable way of looking at it. The problem with that is that at the time that he was adjudicated, he's undoubtedly suffering from a mental impairment. And in those cases in 2006, he didn't contest that. They were, they were submitted, the adjudication was entered, and he was committed without a contested hearing. He had a right to a contested hearing. I'm not arguing otherwise. But someone in that position, I think, understandably doesn't have the same ability to contest um, or to put on evidence as someone who uh, was not suffering from um, mental impairment. At this point, though, um, essentially the state is working to further restrict his fundamental right, uh, but placing the entire burden on him to prove a negative. And that's where I think it's problematic, and the result of that application of the law is overbroad and captures individuals who uh, are not part of what we would characterize as the state's uh, compelling governmental interest. Difference that what we're trying, what what determines whether or not he is in fact um, a menace to, or a you know a, a harm to society or potential harm um, turns on his mental health, which he is in complete control of. Wouldn't it put an awful? I mean, what what would the state do if the burden was on them to have to prove what his mental health status was? So one of the things I think that is available to the state and, and my experience in addressing matters such as this is the state has the ability to conduct discovery. It can gather information. It can take the individual's deposition. If it has concern about whether this individual poses um, threats to the community. Submit to a psych evaluation? I, I believe that the, in, in my experience, as I was indicating, the state can engage in discovery, and so if it wished for the petitioner to have to submit to a psychological evaluation, I think that would be entirely proper to demand that. Um, so nothing's preventing the state from seeking that and from putting on its own testimony if there are legitimate concerns. If we were to say, as you that we should shift the burden over to the state um, to show this sort of dangerousness, You'd agree that we, out of fairness, we'd need to remand this case. Clear that the, tr the district court viewed the burden as on NS, not the state, right? That's my read. Council urged the district court to, to place the burden uh, of persuasion on, on, this, on the government. And does the enactment of uh, the new amendment to the Iowa Constitution support doing so? Argument, uh, Your Honor. I, I believe to do otherwise essentially creates a situation in which you have someone who can satisfy all of the requirements of the statute. In other words, they're able to show they don't have a current mental impairment. They're able to show that there are folks out there who will vouch for their character by testimony and statements. They'll show that they don't have a criminal record. Um, in this case, it goes further than that to show the psychological evaluation, the work history, family history, you name it. And yet, the court says, well, that's just not a high enough quality of evidence, um, or we're just not convinced, despite the record not containing anything specifically saying that this individual poses a threat for these reasons, or there's this instability. There's, in this case, essentially insinuation that, well, because these uh, records weren't there, or because um, on that. <clears throat> I'm not sure if I understand why the Iowa constitutional issue is implicated here. So the state is not restricting his ability to have a firearm, right? Isn't the disability here a federal disability under 18 U.S.C. 922? I think the state, and I see that my time has expired, if, if I could have some additional time to respond. Thank you. Um, the state's effectively uh, impl actual legal prohibition on him owning a firearm is imposed by federal law. Is that right? So if that's true, unless the federal government authorizes the state to create a process to remove the disability, there is no ability for the state of Iowa to remove that federal disability, right? Yes. Why is our state constitution implicated at all? If the federal government in 2007 said, here is the law you must pass, 
and here is the burden of proof, and here who has the burden of persuasion, the state would have to do it. So isn't this just a statutory interpretation question on how we would normally allocate burdens of production and persuasion regardless of what the Constitution says? I believe it was prior to Amendment 1A. And the reason I say that is that effectively, I was operating within that statutory framework. But by doing so in this manner, they're imposing this restriction because this is the hurdle that uh, NS has to overcome in order to receive the relief from disabilities allowed by that process under the federal statute. Uh, by applying this restriction in this way, by setting up this 724-31 uh, framework and then requiring the burden be placed on him as the district court did in this case, that's essentially creating that uh, that burden, that uh, restriction um, that would be subject to that strict scrutiny under 1A. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Valencia. Thank you, Madam Chief Justice. May it please the court, counsel. Iowa takes the protection of gun rights seriously. And Iowa's recently enacted constitutional amendment, Article 1, Section A, does guarantee the right to bear arms for Iowans under the Iowa Constitution. But that amendment recognizes that the right is not without its own limitations. Any restrictions must satisfy strict scrutiny. The issue here for NS is that constitutional amendments do not apply retroactively, absent express language saying so. And there is... I mean, um, and district court adjudication came after 1A was on the books. Isn't that a prospective application? That would not be a prospective application because we would need to look at um, whether this is a substantive change in the law, and the actual relevant retroactivity event here would be the 2006 adjudication. In 2006, the, his rights were adjudicated to be limited when Iowa... Uh, ordered him to be committed, and that triggered, as Justice McDonald was talking about, a federal restriction. He's not attempting a collateral attack on the 2006 adjudication. He's, he's saying that I was unduly restricting um, his ability to restore his fire, his right to possess firearms. And that happened in, after, the, after the law 1A was enacted, right? The adjudication here did happen after the law was enacted, but when we're looking at whether the, this would, application of Section 1A would apply retrospectively, we look at, does, are the state's duties and rights changed? Is there a difference between if he had brought this claim before and after in terms of what? I'm, assume we're not, assume, yeah, we'll consider it carefully, but assume we don't accept your retroactivity argument. What's your position on the argument uh, made by NS that uh, the effect of the amendment was to shift the burden of proof since state has to you know, demonstrate compelling state interest at strict scrutiny, shift the burden of proof uh, to the state here. If, if you were to assume that, that 1A applies here and that strict scrutiny applies, um, this would still satisfy strict scrutiny because the burden here, Section 1A did not change any uh, burden that's required in 724.31. Because if you compare 724.31 to 34 U.S.C. 49.15, that's the federal statute that says, states, if you want to participate in this federal program where you can get grant money to participate in the NICS system, the federal background check system, it said you need to put a program that matches this. Iowa took the language in 49.15, and that language is the language that petitioner challenges, which says, quote, the person will not be likely to act in a manner dangerous to public safety. But, but the federal law doesn't say who has the burden of proof, but the court placed the burden of proof here. Why can't we say that under the amendment you can't do that anymore? Your Honor, the federal law does not expressly say the burden of proof is on petitioner, but if you look at the standard that the federal law requires that Iowa then adopted, it requires that there's a showing that the person, the petitioner NS here, will not be likely to act in a manner dangerous to public safety. That is expressly a burden put on him. The state, if this, that, that doesn't necessarily follow, that that would be the state's burden to show that he's not likely to act in a manner dangerous. And that, if you look at what petitioner's asking for here, he's asking you not to just put the burden and apply the same standard. He's asking... 
Looking at the federal statute, I don't see anything about burden of proof in it. Not burden of proof, Your Honor, but the standard is the person will not be likely to act in a manner dangerous to public safety. What puts put the burden on the state to to prove that the person will not be likely to act in a uh, will be it will <laughs> doesn't meet that standard. Why? I mean, it doesn't. You know, it's a standard. Why can't we put the burden on the state to disprove that standard? The, the, the word choice there is important because the burden that would be put on the state would be to show that petitioner will be likely to act in a manner dangerous. That's what petitioner is acting for here, asking for here. The, there's, there's a gap of conduct in between showing that you will not be likely to be dangerous and the state having to show you will be likely to be dangerous. There's some ambiguity in the, some, some work in the statute. Shouldn't we uh, avoid any uncertainty about constitutional problems by erring on the side of putting the burden on the state? No, Your Honor, because not only would that be having to uh, rewrite the statute, the, the important part here is too, the burden was already on the state. The state met its burden in 2006 by clear and convincing evidence that the petitioner here posed a danger to the public interest and had a serious mental health impairment. And then another point why you shouldn't put the burden on the state here, it's, it would be impractical. It's, it would not be workable. And when you look, when you're analyzing under... Don't we often in other contexts require the state to show that a person is dangerous now, like in civil commitment situations? Can, if you want to keep somebody committed, show me a recent act, uh, over, recent overt act, right? So I feel like the state could, just as uh, was your friend on the other side suggest, you know, do some discovery, do some investigation, show that this person is dangerous which I think is the state's interest, right? The state's interest is in keeping dangerous folks from, from having firearms, right? That is Your Honor, but the, the point about discovery, um, I have to correct something that my friend on the other side said. It's not possible for the state to order this person to undergo a psychological evaluation. And, and it's not even possible for the state to get their criminal history in, in these types of civil proceedings. To get their criminal history from the federal uh, background check system, the state can't get it here. The reason we can get it is if they put it in place. And so the state, in the initial proceeding, in the commitment proceeding, the statute there, Chapter 229, authorizes the state, or excuse me, authorizes the court to order the petitioner um, to undergo a psychological evaluation. There's no such stat statutory authority here. So if you were to put the burden on the state here, this goes back to my practical point. It would not be... Sorry to interrupt, but... I <laughs> On that point, um, Iowa Rule of Civil Procedure 1.515 authorizes uh, independent medical exams, which can be for mental health assessments. Um, isn't this restoration ac action a civil procedure, and, and isn't that available as your opposing counsel uh, agreed it would be? You can order an IME. These proceedings work is that it, it the state is severely limited in the discovery that it can get that's how these proceedings have worked on, on the ground is my understanding the other point though is that even were the state to be able to subject him to a mental health evaluation he did do a mental health evaluation here in but the problem was it was entirely a self-reported mental health evaluation and it showed that he was not forthcoming and in fact did directly lie this wasn't just a situation of holding things back that what that did happen in, when he came back the second day, it wasn't because this was a multi-day evaluation. He came back two days after the initial one and said, you know what? And then put the burden of proof on the state. Maybe the state will win. Your Honor, the, the issue here is that it wasn't just that this, if the state were needed to conduct a mental health evaluation. He did conduct one and showed that he was not being forthcoming and was not uh, trustworthy here. So we don't counsel, it was because the burden was placed on, on him, right? I mean, that's sort of the fundamental issue that I think we're, we're having up here. Under strict scrutiny, it has to be narrowly tailored. And if, if, if something might sweep in people that should otherwise get relief under the statute, we can't say that it's narrowly tailored. And by placing the burden on, on him, it potentially sweeps in people that, that shouldn't be subject to it anymore. Isn't that a problem? I mean, isn't that sort of the fundamental issue? It's not a problem here because with strict scrutiny, it's whether it's narrowly tailored to further the compelling interest. The courts, this court, the Supreme Court has told us, the U.S. Supreme Court, that the alternative that we're looking at, the least restrictive alternative, must still serve the interest, quote, about as well. 
And here it doesn't serve the interest of Bout as well because the interest, which is uncontested, is to restrict, uh, to prohibit the possession of firearms by somebody who has been adjudicated to have a chronic, serious mental impairment and be dangerous. And I'm still struggling on maybe why this is a constitutional question. Let's assume Iowa decided that it did not want to participate in the federal grant program. It would not even have to have a statute that allowed anybody to petition to remove the federal disability. Isn't that right? That's exactly right, right Your Honor. And just completely disallow it as a state. That would be perfectly fine under federal law, under the Supremacy Clause. It is what it is. So now that we do have a statute, I'm not sure why the Constitution mandates any particular burden of proof, given that we don't even have to have a statute at all. So help me out with that. I think that's right, Your Honor. And if we look at how other states across the country treat this, it's about 10 to 15 other states that don't have a firearms relief disability statute. Uh, as far as we could tell, the states across the board place the burden on the petitioner. 11 states require the petitioner to satisfy, make this finding or showing by a clear and convincing evidence standard. The Attorney General Office's position that even with the enactment of 1A, if it weren't for federal law, Iowa could say, you know, if you've ever had a mental health adjudication, you cannot ever have a firearm in the state of Iowa. That's your position because the petitioner here would still have recourse through uh, federal courts. You could go to federal court as other petitioners in states that don't have this. View of federal law, does that, that 1A permits that level of restriction in your view? Your Honor, um, it, it's, the state's interest here is to make sure that when somebody feels that they are recovered from their mental, uh, serious mental impairment, that they can have a chance to come to Iowa courts and, and petition to get the relief. That's why Iowa has a statute. That's why we want to uphold it as constitutional. If it were to be ruled unconstitutional here, his, his remedy in this case is, would be that then he, has, he can't petition anymore. The Attorney General's office wants the statute to be, still stay in place and further this compelling interest of ensuring that only people that are, have been adjudicated to have a chronic, serious mental impairment and pose a danger, and that can't make the lowest civil uh, standard showing that they are no longer, not, they're not likely to be a danger. We don't want to have people that aren't likely to be a danger to uh, have their rights restricted. That's why this is in place. But states, states across the country don't have it. Iowa's compelling interest is to make sure we do have it, and that's why when you look at uh, strict scrutiny, you have to take, take that compelling interest sort of as a given. And we need to look at what is the least restrictive alternative that still furthers that compelling interest. There's no compelling interest in Iowa to ha get rid of this statute. That, that Iowa wants to make sure that it's only people that can make the show that they're, sorry. It's just safety, I, and I think everyone would agree with that, but there are a variety of, you know, the compelling interest is not the enforcement of the statute per se, and that's what you seem to be saying. Safety, yes, Your Honor. And that's why um, the alternative should not be to flip the burden. That should not be the remedy here because that would put us out of compliance with federal law and then lose the grant m money, which is why the, the statute was passed in the first place, which is... It says that the grant money, if we interpreted the state statute in a manner that imposes the burden on the state to show that someone is dangerous before you can prevent them from having the right to protect themselves in, uh, with a firearm. I don't have a case that says specifically that case, but what I have is the, the statute. And the federal statute, 34 U.S.C. 4915, requires a very specific program. It, it requires that the standard be that the court finds this person will not be likely to um, pose a danger to the public interest which the funding has been um, taken away for any reason. Where the funding has been taken away. What I do have is, is states that have a firearms disability relief statute that does not meet the federal standard. And these are cases, these are states like Connecticut and California and Georgia. This, those states have a firearms relief disability statute because it doesn't match 4915, the, the, the federal law, they don't get that funding. They still have the statute, but they, they put the burden on the state? I think California's might. Right, Your Honor. And, and that's why, one of the reasons why it doesn't meet the federal law to get the grant relief. And if you look at the history of how these laws were passed, of course this is just speculation, but in 2008, this 4915 was passed by the U.S. Congress. In 2011, on January 1st, 724-31 went into effect. Two 
make sure that Iowa had this program in place so that it could get this grant relief money so that it could help uh, make sure that the national criminal background check system was robust. This statute went in place in the, uh, the wake of the Virginia Tech shootings and the U.S. Congress and then Iowa decided, let's make sure that we have a robust background check system. Practical problems if we did shift the ultimate burden of proof to the, to the government. Um, could, couldn't the government request uh, execution of a patient's waiver um, under Iowa Code 622.10.3 since the petitioner by definition is putting his mental health in, in issue? And w would that help? I, I'm not 100% familiar with, with that, that provision, Your Honor. I, but I suppose if, if they did request it, there's a chance they don't get it. But then there's still the other problem of, we're not asking petitioner to prove a negative, like in the um, no conduct order uh, circumstances, like the State v. Petro case, where you're asking somebody to prove the negative that somebody else's fear no longer exists. Here, you're asking him not to prove a negative, to prove that he, he holds all the knowledge here. He needs to make this very low showing now, because remember, the state has already met its burden by clear and convincing evidence, and he now needs to come to the court and say, here's this evidence of my track record. Here's how I'm doing. And here, the facts here in the firearms relief disability world are just not a close call. The, the court, as, as your honors have alluded to, made a finding that petitioner was not forthcoming. They made, and that's at A19 to 20. Um, it wasn't just a suggestion, it was a finding that, and to your honors question about whether we can defer that finding, we can. The de novo review is de novo as to whether the totality of the circumstances here uh, meet, meet the standard. As for the factual findings, we can defer to the district court's sweaty palms. He saw this petitioner testify. This petitioner testified at the hearing. So it's, sorry, I thought somebody asked a question. Um, the petitioner testified at the hearing and we can defer to that finding. I see my time is up. If the court doesn't have any further questions, we would ask, okay. Is there evidence in the hearing of actual dangerousness? The, the evidence in the hearing shows that he is still uh, abusing the same substances that he was committed for in 2006. The evidence shows that he has a chronic serious mental impairment, which is um, bipolar disorder that does not go away. There's no cure. It has to be treated and managed. And the evidence shows he says therapy would, would not be worth his while. And but yet when he uh, was under severe family stress, he decided to return back to the pills. Did Dr. Reddy back in, was it 2006 or 2008, say that there was no mental illness? Uh, Dr. Reddy still identified him with mental illness, but at SA 23, there, was, there are a series of mental illnesses he diagnosed. The question was whether it was serious in that exact moment, and Dr. Reddy said that it was um, more of a behavioral issue because the issue there was, wasn't as much the substance abuse active at the time, it was violence and threats. But again, what we're looking at is the, is the, um, the totality of the circumstances. That's one piece of evidence in, in the record. We also have the 2006 records, and then we have a 15-year gap, and then the only other mental health record he put in was 2022, a month after he got denied his concealed carry license, in a mental health evaluation that was self-reporting, in which he said he had a lot riding on it, in which he was not only just not forthcoming, that he lied. Is relying on the fact that he did um, have a, a firearm license in Nebraska, uh, says he was unaware it was prohibited by federal law, and that he's relying on that history that he, he safely used guns for several years. Uh, should we give that any weight, or does that, would doing so create a perverse incentive in restoration cases? It would create an extreme perverse incentive because evidence of unlawful firearm possession is not evidence that this person is a uh, law-abiding, non-dangerous citizen. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Mr. Mayo? And thank you. I wanted to uh, briefly address a question that had come up regarding uh, whether Iowa even needs to have um, this framework in place and couldn't uh, Iowa essentially say, we're not doing that anymore and you can't, um, uh, you can't apply for uh, relief from disabilities. I'm not sure, given the language of uh, 1A, that that would be proper at this point. I have a very similar uh, constitutional provision. And in the Merritt case, they held that a total ban on felons um, passed strict scrutiny um, and the only, 
and it applied to all felons except for um, uh, if unless they'd been expunged or as a possession of a fire, an antique firearm, um, and it did not apply to misdemeanors. And that was enough to, to let that total ban on all felons. Um, why should we not follow what the Missouri Supreme Court said? I think that's a good point, uh, Your Honor. I, uh, merit is distinguishable in some important ways. And as Your Honor noted, the, the matter in that case pertained to restriction, a blanket restriction on felons having uh, firearms uh, moving forward. I, I think the, co the court there noted that one option available would be a pardon. Um, so it's not that an individual with a felony conviction lacks the ability to move forward and have any hope of regaining that right. 2431 provide that same kind of hope here? Sorry. Doesn't the statute at issue here provide that same kind of hope here? Probably easier than a pardon. Certainly easier than a pardon. I, I don't question that. Um, I, I think that the concern that we have regarding the application of this statute in the wake of uh, the amendment to one uh, under 1A is, um, is that it's overbroad in application. Essentially, you have this compelling governmental interest of ensuring that individuals who are suffering from mental disabilities and mental illnesses don't have firearms, so they're not a threat to their community uh, or themselves. And to apply the statute in this way, where someone shows that they're not suffering and not a threat to themselves or others, um, because you don't believe that they've met or they've produced enough or the quality of evidence required that, to meet their burden placed on them, when the statute doesn't call for that, that's overbroad. That's going to uh, essentially result in... Overbreadth. Um, so the Iowa statute sets it at a preponderance of the evidence. Um, several other states with similar statutes set it at a much higher level um, at clearing convincing evidence. And some other states who don't comply with the statute, with the federal statute and have their own um, system actually place um, the burden differently. So why is setting the, the, the burden at the lower level of preponderance not satisfy um, the, the strict scrutiny that's required, especially when we have said in strict scrutiny context um, that not every conceivable alternative needs to be exhausted. I certainly agree. I, I think that the difference here is because of 1A and uh, requiring that this restriction be context of when we're applying strict scrutiny to a fundamental right, we've said you don't have to exhaust every um, alternative. I still think that in this case where you apply it in the manner that the district court did in the, here to put the burden that's not set forth in the statute on the petitioner, the result of that is you're going to be uh, cutting out a lot of individuals who would otherwise be safe gun owners and don't suffer from any of the concerns. So you think that if the only thing that needs to change is that the burden would shift to the state to prove by preponderance of the evidence? Is that the only thing you're asking for? I think that's important to clarify. We're not saying that we want the statute to go away. I believe that the framework in general is consistent with the Nix Improvement Act and, and the cited code sections that uh, it does afford petitioners the ability to receive this relief from disabilities and if properly applied would fit within uh, the the narrowly tailored um, idea. I mean, the state makes a, makes a good argument, I think, that I, I, I mean, I want to hear you address. I mean, this case, if we remand, uh, the information's already out there because your client had to provide it and because your client had the burden of proof. What do we do about the next case where the burden is going to be on the state if we conclude that 1A imposes uh, a burden on the state to demonstrate that the individual is no lo is still unsuitable for having firearms. Statutory scheme in this case, um, and then moving forward, if that were the court's approach, would still uh, work for, for both parties. Essentially, the petitioner still has the burden of production, and those are very specific and difficult for some petitioners to come up with all of those required aspects as far as the records, in some cases, course have lost the records due to floods or otherwise, it, it can be difficult to uh, gather and present all of the records. So the petitioner still has a pretty heavy burden of production, making sure that all of those aspects are satisfied. Someone who can't show that they uh, are currently not suffering from a mental disability is cut out. Um, someone who can't have people vouch for their character is uh, also disqualified. But it's those situations uh, 
as we would argue is happening here, where the person's able to do all of those things, but that the state has some concerns because of perceived gaps or otherwise about, you know, they thought maybe the parents or, or you know, other individuals who've known the person longer uh, should, should be um, the character witnesses. Uh, that, that sort of additional burden being placed on the petitioner is not called for by the statute and uh, not necessary in order to ensure a framework in which the state um, has to prove, uh, or, where, where the state can prevent individuals who should not have uh, firearms. It seems like on the ground that shifting the burden to the state may make it harder and more cumbersome for applicants to get relief. And I'm just kind of putting myself in the position of an attorney for the state I'm gonna run this to ground if the burden is on the government, which means we're gonna sit down, we're gonna do discovery, we're gonna do depositions, maybe under the rules, I'm gonna have an independent health examination. I wanna make sure that I've seen all your medical records and that you're not hiding anything. It, it just seems as a practical matter, it would go a lot faster and a lot easier for petitioners if they had the burden and they could come in and say, these are all my records and then they go to a hearing and litigate it. Is that a legitimate concern? I'd be interested to see how that would work in practice. I think it's a legitimate concern, um, just as a, a hypothetical, but I think that the state would also have to balance resource considerations in doing so. I can envision that the state would have gone, and because his parents are the ones that had, um, had originally committed him, would have gone and tried to depose his parents. Um, that seems like it would be a very different record than what he was able to put on himself when he got to be the one to choose who those um, people were. And I think that's a great point, Your Honor. I think that in this case, the state had the ability to go ahead and reach out to parents and individuals who were part of those uh, underlying proceedings. They, they didn't do so. And if that were truly a concern, I think it's appropriate and that's what should happen in a case such as this. Uh, where if we believe that there's individuals out there that would say this person isn't safe and shouldn't ever be granted uh, relief from these disabilities, they should be brought into court. They should have uh, their own uh, character statements entered into evidence, but they weren't here because the state didn't feel like there's any reason to do so. Uh, could you respond a little bit to the conversation we were having earlier about sort of the loss of federal funding and whether other states regimes where that are, there's been um, shifting of burdens, could that impact um, what we're trying to decide here? I'd like to say with some certainty, um, but I, I, don't, I don't see examples of that happening, um, and especially not with uh, just shifting the burden from one side to the other. If you take the language of the Next Improvement Act and what's required for the framework um, under that section, this, aligns with it quite nicely. Uh, but the difference here is that the Iowa court, the Iowa district court in this case, applied a burden that's not called for by either statute uh, to determine today that the burden actually rests with the state as a preponderance uh, wouldn't strike me as facially violating any part of the federal law. Do you agree that the state or the, the court could order the petitioner to um execute patients waivers to allow gathering of any uh, medical or mental health records? I do agree with that. And I believe that um, the, the idea that discovery is limited in a case such as this, I don't see support for that. Does NS have uh, untreated um, bipolar disorder? I mean, there was a, a, a diagnosis of bipolar in 2006 and uh, I haven't seen any indication of follow-up care or medication um, in recent years. Record indicated he's not presently in therapy for, for that. And if that's the proper treatment, then I would say it's untreated. When you started your argument, when you came back, you said you weren't sure whether or not Iowa could have decided not to enact the statute. And then there were some questions. So you, I want you to finish that thought in response to this question of my understanding of how federal law and state law interact here is Iowa could do nothing and there would be a federal disability and your client would be stuck. So I think you were addressing that, but finish that thought. I'm addressing that, I apologize. But my argument there is essentially given that we have this in place now, 
and this avenue is open to individuals. Taking that avenue away, I believe, would operate as a further restriction. Under the language of 1A, that they doesn't have to enact the statute at all. And then there would be no state relief. I would agree that they didn't have to. But at this point, if it were to take that away, that would operate as a restriction. And I believe that that act of removing or you know, amending or getting rid of the act entirely uh, to prevent someone from petitioning for relief from disabilities would be subject to that strict scrutiny analysis. So in other words, legislature couldn't repeal this statute? Without some other framework in place allowing someone to obtain relief from disabilities, I don't believe it would be, I don't believe that would survive strict scrutiny. It would, uh, I don't believe the state has a compelling interest in preventing anyone who's ever had a mental health adjudication from having a firearm in the future. Not a compelling interest issue. I mean, it's federal law. <laughs> the state just can't decide to override federal law. Um, I mean, the, the federal government has specifically said, this is how you get removed from a federal disability. Are you saying the state constitution overrides that? It overrides that, but I believe by having this in place at the time of the enactment of 1A, by removing it, you're essentially creating an additional restriction and without that satisfying strict scrutiny, I believe it'd be unconstitutional. Having this in place when the amendment was enacted, um, it kind of sets the framework. Why doesn't the fact that it had been in place for a number of years before the amendment was enacted in 2022 um, with the burden on the, on the applicant mean that the, the amendment kind of brought that in, into play and considered that as um, the appropriate and would satisfy strict scrutiny. I believe that in the prospective application of 1A, uh, to the extent that district courts had treated this previously, and I think that's a fair statement, as placing a burden on the petitioner, I think that, that made a difference. 1A changes that moving forward. Um, in this situation, it's a little different than some of the cited cases uh, dealing with the retroactivity aspects where retroactivity standpoint, but when generally when we look at a constitutional um, provision, we look at what was going on at the time that the amendment was enacted. So when you look at Second Amendment issues, you're looking, you know, back in history. This amendment was enacted two years ago. Um, and so why wouldn't we look at what was, um, I think that everyone has kind of agreed that you're allowed to, the state is allowed, despite 1A, um, in certain situations to take away gun rights. That's kind of included or within the amendment itself. So why can't we look at kind of what the playing field was at the time of the amendment and just and say that that's what, when that amendment was enacted, that that's what the voters were expecting, that this process would continue as it is, but it was fine the way it was as well. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, way of looking. I think that's proper. Um, I would argue otherwise. I, I believe that in this case, the. Uh, the amendment was intended to affect restrictions being imposed on individuals' fundamental rights moving forward. And to the extent that courts are doing so, this isn't in the, the actual plain text language of uh, 724.31. I think it violates, uh, it violates the uh, requirements of 1A to do so. Thank you. Uh, NRA NS is hereby submitted and uh, we'll allow a few minutes here for an exchange of attorneys and get ready for